Wings? I don't have wings. The Dark Crystal. I have absolutely zero context to be talking about this movie in any practical terms. This is not going to be a why it's awesome video. You'll find out why towards the back end. Nor is this going to be a nitpick rant. I don't consider puppetry to be the same as animation. It's not an animation junkie, but I just saw The Dark Crystal, not for the first time, mind you, but for the first time on the big screen that I've gotten to see it. Went with my partner because it's one of her favorite movies, and I kind of want to talk about it because there is a lot of stuff to talk about. If you've never seen The Dark Crystal, what it was is it was Jim Henson taking the artistry and the mastery of puppetry that he'd been working on and developing and moving, you know, elevating with works like The Muppets and Sesame Street and bringing it to fully fleshing out a fantasy world. And the film is, even still, is unlike anything you have ever seen. It is staggering in how gorgeous it is and just how it, it looks, it feels, it moves, it is amazing. Now, Jim Henson was obviously the spearhead for this. A lot of people deserve credit. Frank Oz has a co-directing credit on it. Brian Froud did the uh, the concept art, and he Froud would again work uh, with Henson later on The Labyrinth. And it's just, it's, it's an astounding piece of work. There are no human characters in this. I was gonna say there's no human performance. That's not entirely true because the long shots of some of these um, are basically people with puppet heads on so that they can, you know, climb rocks and whatnot. But like, that's it. There's no human characters. Every character is primarily performed by a puppet and there is very little special effect in this there's like one or two shots that have some compositing in them there's a little bit at the very end but this is this is pre-cgi this is pre you know real good workable green screen they had no cable removal if the if the rods or the cables or a performance hand was in shot they couldn't get rid of it they would have to start over so that's what we're dealing with when we're talking about the level at which this thing was executed at and it it really is just an amazing just deep well i would argue that this is the most complete fully realized fantasy world on film basically until lord of the rings happened and I would possibly argue it might even be a more completely realized world than even Lord of the Rings is, because even Lord of the Rings, they had to, f they found locations that worked perfectly. Don't get me wrong, but they did find real places that you can now visit. The Dark Crystal is, it's, it's almost all sets. There's like one or two long shots that are locations, but it's almost entirely sets. You can't see this anywhere except this movie. It's. It's astounding. I, I suppose I'll clarify practical <laughs> um, fantasy world because I suppose you could toss Avatar out there because it's all CGI, whatever. As far as I'm concerned, that level of CGI, it's just animation. Not to belittle animation, I love it. I'm getting off track. Uh, so this, the, the puppetry in this is, and all of it is astounding. The Skeksis probably take the highlight because we get a really wide range of them being gross and scary and disgusting and funny and they they really run the gamut but beyond that we have the Gartham soldiers. The way that they move and their legs kind of they look like they're scuttling. They're really impressive. The Mystics are just amazing. The Mystics really feel they feel like they could be in a Star Wars movie and and then you even have more Muppet-like puppets, like the Podlings, like Fizzgig, and they still don't feel like, oh, that's just a puppet in this world. They still feel like it works. So <laughs> they managed to create a world with these incredibly realized puppets that feel like living, breathing creatures, and yet can still get away with what is basically just a furball with a mouth on somebody's hand. I don't know how they pulled that off, but they did. And I could, I could go on forever about everything that works in this. I'm, I'm gonna try and spotlight a, a few things. I suppose I should talk a little bit about the story and, and also clarify that later on I'll be getting into spoilers. I mean, that said, it's the, the plot is not such that it has a lot of 
surprising twists and turns. It's a pretty standard hero's journey plot. Um, so if you're expecting big twists, you're you're at the wrong place. But it it is a you know there's something wrong with the world. Here's the guy who's destined to fix it. There he goes to go and try and fix it. And he is believed to be the last of his. Uh, this is Jen I'm talking about now. He he's believed to be the last of his kind. He runs into another one of his kind when he meets Kira. You know, they have a sidekick with Fizzgig. They are being chased by monsters, the Gartham. They are being pursued at the will of the Skeksis. You know, they have to try and restore the crystal, this crystal that cracked a thousand years ago. And that crack, that destruction made the world what it is right now. And so by fixing it, they'll change the world, but, and hopefully for the better, but we don't really know what'll happen when they do that. So there's your basic plot, and it is very basic. But you know, I could—I just need to highlight some of the some of the stuff that's in here. I think the Skeksis are the most impressive piece. I mean, the the Mystics are gorgeous. The Gartham are great, and, and there's some others that I'll even mention. But the Skeksis, first of all, design-wise, are you know they've got these bird heads, and but they're all unique. They've all got unique designs, and those designs tell you a lot about each of them. Just. At a, at a quick glance. You've got one that's very much into food and always eating. He's got a slightly more scrunched up nose and kind of a look to him. You've got this one with like this monocle. He's the scientist. And you know, you've got the, the general who sort of takes over when the emperor dies. You've got the chamberlain who's the sneaky little bugger. It's, it's really, you get so much personality from every single one of these, which I think is what elevates them over the mystics. Because again, I think the mystics are wonderfully realized, but they're all kind of interchangeable. You can't tell one from the other. Uh, but with the Skeksis, at a glance, like, oh boy, that one, and there's that one, and there's this. And yeah, it's not like we get to know many of them um, outside of, of the Chamberlain, the scientist, the, the general, and there's kind of like um, a one who's like a kind of a second in command that's about it. There's a bunch of them that we just kind of see, but don't get much of a feel for, but they look so unique that they get away with that. And there's a ton of little details. Like there's one of the earliest shots. I mean, well, this thing opens with the crystal chamber for the crystal. That shot is so lingering and loving and amazing to see on the big screen. I mean, I'd only ever seen this movie on home video up to this point, but to see that crystal chamber with that music, Trevor Jones's music kicking in and these Skeksis moving about. And even as some of the credits go on, you know, the the, the crystal like sends out beams and it locks in the rice and they kind of freeze, but they're not just completely still. It moves across each of them and they're like, they're like breathing. Parts of, little parts of them are pulsing. Uh, the, the general, his eyes, twitching and the, it's these little touches that make them alive and make them real and it's it's so just stunning um, I mentioned the mystics who are are very they're kind of Yoda <laughs> they're all not so much in appearance but certainly in plot function and in, in terms of you know just the Zen nature of them they fit that really well I actually have a really soft spot for Agra who's this kind of weird prophet sort of person um you know she she gives some plot points later on she gives the heroes a, an object that that they need but she's only got one eye which she can take out and look around with and she also has what is personally my favorite line in the film uh which is she gets told by jen you know who sent him in it and it was his master the wisest of the mystic and he goes and she goes where is he is he here no he's dead could be anywhere then. I love that. I love I love that line so much because it says so much about her and possibly you know even this world. Like, can they hang around? Eh. She certainly thinks they can, and that's fun regardless. Um, so I I like her a lot. She's God. She's bonkers. Um, I, I I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight this one because this this is this is my partner's absolute favorite character, and uh, that's Fizzgig. It's Fizzgig. <laughs> Is just this little round ball with eyes. He barks. He's like, rawr, 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 rawr. but when he roars, when he gets upset, the mouth goes from this to this, and it's all teeth. And he has this one moment of just whining when he gets told he needs to stay behind. He just goes, rawr, 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 rawr. oh my! It's everybody in the theater cracked up at that. Everybody was losing it laughing, and it's. 
awesome. Fizz Geek is so much fun, and he's he's the he's endearing. I think partially because he's so small, but he's also he's also brave at the right moments, but also kind of a coward because he'll roar at something and then run away. That's kind of his go-to tactic. But he he is he is a the great little animal sidekick. He works really well for that. Um, but you know, I've been. Praising this thing up and down, left and right. But like I said, this is not going to be an, an entry of why it's awesome. And there's a pretty point of reason for that. I'll come to that too. There's a couple of little stumbling points as it goes along. Um, when I saw it in the theater, it actually came with a little sort of thing ahead of it um, with Jim Henson's daughter talking about the process of making it. And she, she mentioned something that I think I'd read somewhere before, but I'd forgotten, which was that originally the Skeksis um, and some of the other characters didn't have English, didn't have understandable dialogue. And so the intent was that the story was clear enough from the visuals, you didn't need to know what they were saying. And it turned out when they did their first test screening, that was not true. And as much as I said the, sto the story is very bare bones, which it is, at the same time, there's just enough going on in terms of how the structure of the Skeksis work and why, the specific reasons why they're doing what they're doing. You do kind of need to know a little bit more than you could get from just unintelligible noises. Uh, I, I mean, like I said, the, the plot is incredibly straightforward, but if you're actually gonna understand the why of anything and the motivations, you do need to have voice. So, so they went back and had to write out and record dialogue that would fit the mouth movements they already had on film that were originally just gibberish. And I think, and they did pretty well at that, but I think something that they did is I think they overcompensated for the fact that people didn't understand what was going on because the, the basic plot and the setup gets explained and re-explained and re-explained a lot across this movie and Jen has these weird internal monologue moments that were very obviously tossed in because like we should understand what he's thinking a bit more but what he's thinking isn't helpful that shouldn't be there so they, they kind of they swung the pendulum too far that said I'm sure it's better as it is now than when you couldn't understand what the heck was going on but I think I think they overcompensated a little bit trying to be really sure everybody got was what was going on that's honestly that's kind of a minor thing though that's that's a nuance to the storytelling that doesn't impact the overall story itself all that much but there's a really big problem with this movie and I named it already. It's called Jen. Jen is our hero. He is a Gelfling. And there's a number of problems with him. There's a narrative problem with him and there's an execution problem with him. I'll start with the execution because that's easier to get past. So the Gelflings, it's him and Kira. And honestly, I think Kira works better. I think they just did enough with her face that it was, or maybe it's just because we don't have as many lingering close-ups on her face that I felt like it didn't look as off-putting, but um, the, the fundamental problem with the design of the Gelflings, Jen particularly, is they look too human. Not that they could ever possibly pass for anything other than puppets, but that's the thing. You've basically got an uncanny valley thing going on where they look human enough where the, the ways in which they move that aren't as fluid or as natural as a human performer would be really stand out. And... So, like, some of the stuff I mentioned earlier with the Skeksis, like, all the little touches, like, little breath motions and, you know, and the things like that, every, because those are so clearly not human, every little touch you add like that makes them feel more alive. In the case of Jen, it's the opposite. Because he looks so close to human, every little thing that you, that is missing just makes it stand out all the more that this is a puppet. And again, to make the comparison, both uh, the Gelfling and the Skeksis, they have these really thin hands and they're cable controlled. So they're not, there's no, there's not somebody's hand in there, you know, working it where, you know, where you can get full fluid movement. It's cable controlled, which means they're a bit more like this. And with the Skeksis, you get away with that because they've got these clawed bird hands, that's fine. But you've got Jen's fingers that are supposed to look like human fingers and they're just sort of these mechanical movements and it just it takes you it takes you out of it you can't buy them and but honestly that would not be so bad that would just be a technical hiccup if it wasn't for the narrative problems with this guy which is okay i'm not gonna say that 
prophecies and prophesied heroes and destiny narratives never work. Sometimes they do, but as a rule, I don't like them. And everything that I hate and everything that can go horribly wrong with a Destiny narrative is embodied in this one character. I never liked Jen, but watching it this time, it boggled my mind how worthless he is as a character. He is a hero by narrative decree. There is nothing about him that actually makes him the hero. He doesn't choose to go on his path. He's given a quest by his dying master. He doesn't understand what he's doing. He doesn't understand why he's doing it. He has no personal motivation. He doesn't even have much in the way of skills. So it's not even like a Mary Sue situation where it's been determined he will be the best at everything just so that he can complete his quest. No, he kind of sucks at everything and yet is still destined to be the one to pull this all together. Like you want to compare him to Kira. Kira is a way better character and I, I actually, I would be singing this thing's praises if Jen had started out being the one who was going to fulfill the prophecy and by the end it was Kira who did it. Because all the prophecy says is that a Gelfling has to fix the crystal. Why are we stuck with Jen? Okay, but comparison-wise. So, Kira, she knows the world. She knows way more about the world than he does. She can talk to animals. She is, she is actively able to escape and get away and hide. She has wings. She, she saves herself when she gets captured, so she doesn't need him. Jen, there was a point where Jen, the, the Gartham soldiers are coming and tearing up this, this town, this village, and Jen is literally just standing there going, he doesn't move until Kira tells him to run. Oh man, he's used. There's literally one thing. Okay, fine, two. There's two things that he does. One, he identifies the correct crystal by blowing into a pipe. Yay. And two, the narrative has decided that he can read and Kira can't. So he reads the prophecy, but we didn't even need him for that because the prophecy gets explained by Skeksis about 10 seconds after that anyway. So. He's, oh my god, he's useless and worthless and boring. He's so bad. Like, there's absolutely no internal reason why this character should be our hero, except that there's a prophecy, and he is the prophesied hero, so here's your hero. Like, no, I reject your prophecy. I reject your hero, because he sucks. And it really is, it's the, it's the brick around the neck of this of this film. It does not make the film not worth seeing. You should, because it is a stunning piece of work. It's just such a shame that we're stuck. Like, every time we'd cut back to him to check in on how our hero was doing, I'd kind of slump in the chair. As good, like, we'd be dealing with the Skeksis and, you know, what was going on with, with the Gartham as they're tracking them down or, or anything like that. And I'd be, oh. And then Jen would show up on screen again and just, fine deal with you and it really is a shame and I think Jen is the overriding reason why for me I, I prefer Labyrinth I think uh, if you're talking Jim Henson fantasy works I think Dark Crystal is the more impressive piece but Jen just drags it down man he's He's no good I mean thankfully things get better once he's paired with Kira because Kira is I get I I want to say she's a better realized puppet. That could just be there aren't as many lingering shots on her. Like I said, she's definitely a better character, regardless. So, you know, what she shows up with him, it the, the movie picks up a little bit, but man, God, Jen sucks. And, and that is a shame, because otherwise this is an astounding film. And if you have not seen it, you should see it. And if you have the opportunity to ever see a screening on the on the big screen, on a proper theater screen, do it. Even if you're just like, ah, oh, that was pretty good. No. No, 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 no. See it. It's incredible. So those are my thoughts on a completely otherwise unprompted um, look at The Dark Crystal. I'm really glad I went to see it, despite the little mini rant I went on about its hero. I had a really good time. Uh, at the theater with this one. So, The Dark Crystal. Have you seen it? What are your thoughts about it? Whatever they are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. There's all the stuff to do. Support me on Patreon, buy a t-shirt, Twitter, podcast, blah. Links for everything is down in the description. So until next time, 
This council is adjourned.